Deborah, I love your hair, by the way. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Thank you so much for joining the RTD Accountability Committee's Operations Subcommittee. Uh, today is Wednesday, May 5th. Uh, welcome, members of the subcommittee. We have a pretty packed agenda, so I'm going to go ahead and just get us started. Um, I'm going to assume that folks have had a chance to review the April 21st operations meeting summary. If there's any edits or modifications, please feel free to send that over to Dr. Cog's staff. Uh, one thing that I do just want to share with folks, hi Elise, um, is that the recommendation uh, has moved forward um, from this committee and will be presented at the uh, operations committee or the full RTD accountability committee meeting on Monday. So thank you all for um, providing your additional feedback and comments on the recommendation um, between our meetings. Um, all right, I'm gonna move us forward in the agenda. We have two topics that we're going to um, dedicate roughly about, I'm gonna say 40 minutes and then 20 minutes. So the first is a recommendation on performance measures. We have the North Highlands team um, with us today, just as a grounding for today's conversation, as you all will remember um, back in late March, early April, we hosted a joint meeting with the finance committee as the conversation around performance measures really started to come up within both of the committees themselves. Using that, um, we've started some work uh, with North Highland to help us assess what are some other perform performance measures that other agencies have used that we may want to consider taking into account that RTD has a lot of information. The goal of this recommendation is to simply make it easier and more accessible for community and for various constituents to really engage with the data and information in a way that's easy and digestible. So that's really the, the background and the context for the partnership or the performance measures um, conversation. We'll dedicate about 20 minutes to discuss the recommendation on partnerships. For this committee, um, as a reminder, this is coming from the governance committee, although there is an operations component. And so the purpose of today's conversation is really just to give a final go, a review of the, the partnerships recommendation from the perspective of operations. So in terms of service and any other um, operations related outcomes that we might, might wanna see reflected in that recommendation. So with that, I'm gonna stop talking. And Tanya, I see that you're on the line with us. So I'm gonna turn it over to the North Highlands team to walk us through the recommendations. Great, thank you very much. And thanks for having us today. Um, Sarah Gosselin, she's on the line here. She's gonna go ahead and um, should do the screen share for us today. The conversation, um, you know, we've got, we've got Anna, um, who you've all met, you've also met Ala, and then um, Sarah um, joining us today. And so um, we'll go ahead and in the interest of time, keep us moving. Um, so uh, Sarah, if you could go ahead and advance just one slide. So talk a little bit about, um, you know, just quick, quick introductions as we typically do, quick recap of our previous discussion. And then we're gonna dive into the proposed metrics, um, which will be kind of the meat of the conversation and Ala will lead that for us. And then we'll wrap up with um, next steps. So Sarah, if you wouldn't mind. Um, so I think you all are familiar with Anna and I, great to see you all again, and uh, of course you've seen Ala in the past. Um, he's uh, one of our data and analytics SMEs, knows an awful lot about data analysis and KPIs and, and brings a lot to the table in that aspect. And we're also joined today uh, by Sarah, who did a lot of, a lot of the research um, that we all saw um, in our last meeting a few weeks back. Sarah, if you could just once more. Um, so again, we're here today to, you know, the overall purpose of this, um, as Dea said, is, you know, to, to develop recommendations um, that are reflective of RTD's performance. So bearing in mind um, that, you know, performance metrics um, are often tied to strategy. Um, RTD is, you know, already in process of, of developing a new strategy. And so, you know, that's typically where it starts. Um, so this these performance metrics, you know, should hopefully be something that can inform um, RTD um, and their strategic planning process moving forward. So our purpose here today is just to review those those metrics um, that that we are proposing. Um, so if you could, and one more, thanks, Sarah. Um, just to recap, um, you know, where, where we uh, left last time. So you know, we've had two discussions. Um, the first is kind of introducing the concept and what we'll be doing. 
And then in our last session, you know, we, we really got some great feedback from you all to kind of shape um, the recommendations that you are about to see. Um, you know, and we began with really looking at these, um, these performance metric areas. These, these were sort of themes that we found in going through, um, you know, previous accountability committee um, meeting minutes and materials. Um, that were available, these sort of break out into, it, it, we, we found some objectives that you all were trying to achieve um, or, or, or thought were important rather for, for RTD to achieve. And so we kind of bucketed those um, objectives into these areas. And so within, um, within each of these uh, metric areas for the objectives, we looked to identify between one and three metrics um, that, that could be considered um, and again, you know, we really relied on looking at a lot of peer agencies that we knew had good data available and knew that, you know, they tied their, um, their strategic, um, their, their performance measurements directly to their strategic plans. And so um, those peer agencies there on the right. Um, so again, you know, just we knew DART, for example, has a wealth of information on their website and dashboard form and really helpful, gave us a lot of ideas um, and, you know, state of Utah historically just being good in best practice and, and reporting metrics. And so, um, you know, the Utah Transit Authority being another good, good recommendation and, and on down the line. So, um, you know, a, a really, you know, just kind of aggregating all of that information. We shared that with you all last time and, and you gave us uh, your feedback and, and a lot of great information, a lot of, a lot of great thoughts that you shared with us. Um, and that, that really helped us shape that next step. Um, so with that, I think we'll get into what those recommendations are, and, and I'll turn it over to um, to Ala for this. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me well. It is nice to meet you all again. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so we wanted, and we could go to the next slide, Sarah. I, so we wanted to share with you the list of uh, 22 uh, unique metrics that tie back to the objectives that Tanya just showed us uh, uh, a second ago. Uh, what, what we wanted to get you familiar with is in the detailed report for each metric, we will be providing you what you're seeing in front of you, which is what is the metric? How is it calculated? What is the RTD goal as part of the quarterly uh, board report as part of the goals that you already have? If there is no uh, goal identified as part of the quarterly board uh, report, uh, we, we provided one that we would like for you to ev further evaluate and decide what would be the appropriate goal for you. And then what is the frequency as well as any helpful notes to help explain for each uh, metric. So we're not going to this level of detail today, but we wanted to let you know that this will be available as part of the report that we will be providing you. Um, and we could go to the next slide. So out of the 22 reports, just to give you a big picture, uh, you already are, are, are the 22 metrics, sorry, you're already collecting a good number of those, uh, about 10 uh, to be exact. And some of them within, with, with a little bit of variation uh, can, uh, you're, you're, you're tracking and some of them are new. So we indicate on the right side of this view, the instances where what is the current RTD metric uh, whether it's the same or it's a little bit varies a little bit from what we're recommending or if it, it doesn't exist. So you'll, you'll see that. Uh, so for the first objective from an operational effectiveness, uh, we're looking to increase ridership, to provide dependable service and to ensure fleet reliability. For increasing ridership, we're looking at the uh, percent boarding change uh, by mode, uh, where RTD captures the overall ridership increase, the, 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 the subtle delineation is, is adding the dimension of looking at it by mode. Uh, the, the second metric, which is providing dependable, a dependable service, and this is where we look at percentage of on-time performance by mode. I'm, I, I know related to rail, there's the public performance measure and the timetables and so forth, and here we're dealing with more than just that so we wanted to identify one which is which is uh, uh, aligned to what you already track today, which is local, regional, light rail, and commuter rail on time performance. From a fleet reliability perspective, uh, we've identified the metric, which is the percentage of vehicles 
over their useful lifetime, uh, where to the current metric today is the average age of the bus fleet, to be specific. We can go to the next one. Um, from a financial performance perspective, we broke it out into the two objectives. How do we efficiently manage finances and how do we achieve outstanding financial performance? For the first, uh, the, top, the initial two you, are, you already have, operating cost recovery ratio and percent increase in fair uh, revenue. Uh, the additional one uh, we're proposing is the cost per mile as compared to peer agencies, just to give you a, a benchmark uh, to, to be able to compare. And then from achieving outstanding financial performance, uh, bond rating is what, what's been, what we identified. You can go next one. From a customer experience perspective, so we looked at number one, providing an excellent rider experience, and number two, engaging with the customers. From a uh, providing an excellent uh, rider experience, uh, tracking the percentage of, um, of time passengers are in a crowded um, area, and, and, and we recognize with the automatic passenger counters that would help provide some of that information. Uh, and then recognizing that the time that we live in right now, uh, being in a crowded zone and being in a clean zone is, 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 a, is a key uh, item on people's mind, on riders' mind and others. Um, the second one is the average facility and vehicle cleanliness uh, complaints per month. Uh, uh, where the current RTD metric is the graffiti and facility maintenance complaints. As we as we go to engaging with the customers, uh, there, there are similarities with what you measure with what's measured today by by RTD. Uh, the call answer rate efficiency in seconds, and then the average time to resolve an issue, uh, where it's very similar. Today, we have the average telephone or information center speed to, of answer, as well as the average response time to customer complaints. So you could see the uh, connectedness with what's being measured today. Go next. Uh, community engagement, um, number of civic engagement presentations. Uh, where where RTD captures this, captures this metric effectively by department uh, as well as purpose. So we only identified one as it related to community engagement at this point. So next, and then we 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 mentioned last time the the objective as it relates to equity and accessibility where when we look at equity, we want to serve all populations. And when we look at accessibility, we want to serve all customers. Uh, from an equity perspective, the uh, Federal Transit Administration Title VI trien trien nail, <laughs> excuse me, everyone, uh, review compliance. Uh, these reviews are completed, uh, but, but the results we, we would recommend to be included, where today they're not included in the quarterly board report. Uh, and then the percentage of customers indicating service frequency meets their needs from a survey perspective. And then when, when we look at serving all customers, uh, we recommend tracking the percentage of elevators and escalators that are available uh, for a particular period of time at a particular period of time. And then from, 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 from an ADA perspective, adherence to uh, ADA zero denial service requests mandate, which is available today at, from an RTD metric perspective. Go next. From an environmental impact, uh, we've identified what is the percentage of low emission vehicles in, your, in the fleet. Uh, so I believe that one's self-explanatory. And then from a safety perspective, we wanted to make sure that we are, uh, we are very comprehensive as it relates to safety, as we recognize the importance of safety. Uh, so from uh, operating a, a safe uh, system, 
we would uh, we recommend continuing the metric that you the RTD measures today, which is the number of preventable accidents per 1,000 100,000 miles, and then what uh, additionally tracking signal violations. And then from a employee safety perspective, which is very important, uh, tracking the number of reported employee equipment uh, accidents. And then for keeping the system secure uh, offenses and citations per 100,000 riders is a recommended metric, as well as continuing to track the average response time to emergency dispatch calls. How fast are we responding to uh, an emergency or an incident in the event it occurs. Okay, let me go next. Um, so that concludes the list of 22 metrics that we have identified. Uh, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer. Otherwise, I will, I will hand it over to Tanya. And Tanya, I do see, it looks like Rhett has a question. So Rhett, if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself. Done. Um, you so you, you mentioned the average uh, age of fleet. And I'm curious how you measure that. Do you measure that by the age of the vehicle or the number of miles on the vehicle or the number of use hours on the vehicle? Because for example, during this last period of the pandemic, We've had a fair number of vehicles that are essentially parked, you know, that are not needed in order to be able to continue to serve the demands, or we didn't have all the operators we needed either. So, I'm, you know, you, you can have a vehicle that's old, but it's perfectly good because it hasn't been used as much. So how is that metric maintained? I, this is an issue also uh, especially with electric vehicles and depreciation, because they last so much longer. Uh, Ala? Thank you. Yes, I think Tanya on, was on mute, but I'd be happy to chime in after you, Tanya. Uh, yeah, thank you for thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so we're recommending that the useful life be um, captured by the asset management system that RTD has in place, um, which should incorporate depreciation tables. So um, while it is true that, you know, a vehicle, um, you know, can be 10 years old and only have a thousand miles on it, I don't know, probably not in transit, right? But, um, you know, their uh, vehicles typically do, um, at the time of purchase, have an have a average lifespan or expected lifespan. And then through vehicle overhauls, through their vehicle overhaul system, RTD can, or, or, or program, RTD can extend the life of those vehicles. So it is... Um, it is dependent on the vehicle itself um, and, and any type of overhaul program. So that would be maintained within um, RTD's asset system. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I definitely would, looking at mileage is, 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 is a good sub uh, indicator to look at RUT. But I wonder also when it comes to uh, the age of the fleet, as, as new models are coming out, there are new safety uh, uh, features incorporated into the new vehicle fleet. So there are things that uh, are not necessarily fully dependent on the on the fact that this uh, vehicle is operational, but rather is this vehicle including uh, some of the telematics information, some of the other information that are consistently being renewed in vehicles. Uh, again, uh, definitely we would take it with a grain of salt, but directionally, as Tanya mentioned, I would support that as well. May I ask, may I clarify something with the information provided, please? Yes. Please. Okay, so basically the Federal Transit Administration, there's a life expectancy rate that we utilize for vehicles is 12 to 15 years or 500,000 uh, 500, miles. And basically there are, we have to do um, uh, preventative maintenance that's required at 6,000 miles. So there's threshold. So what we just heard from Tanya and all up, it does make sense, but you still have to, you still have to have contingency vehicles in your fleet that could, that could expand that lifespan holistically. So regardless of the fact, you have to ensure that you have a vehicle in the state of the repair. So there's other ancillary factors that have to be included when we talk about the useful life of a vehicle, because this is being used for commercial purposes, transporting people. So you have a high level of 
caution and care that you have to adhere to as specified by the US DOT. So all of those parameters need to be taken in consideration. So I just wanted to share that information for everyone's edification. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, so Tanya and Ala, I think what I'm gonna do is just go through the members of the committee and see if there's any additional, um, if anything needs additional refinement, just to, to solicit some feedback from folks. Um, and then we can walk through, I'm sure you have some additional comments or questions. So I'm gonna start with Elise and then I'll go over to Chris. I, I had a question about um, how you decided whether or not it should be a percentage or an absolute number that's reported. Because often it's helpful to have both. I think your environmental one was the number of um, you know, zero emission vehicles. Um, be nice to know that number, but also be know what percentage of, of the full fleet. Um, so I'm just curious how you chose and if it's possible or easily, I think you need, it would be easy to, to put both. So I'm just wondering um, what are the options on that front? Um, I'm, I'm chuckling a little to myself because we did go back and forth on that one in particular um, with the number of low emission vehicles. And I, I think our recommendation is, you know, is, is right now is number. And then in those sort of notes and assumptions section, you know, because RTD doesn't track this now, don't really know what a good goal is. Um, and so does it make more sense for RTD to track to, um, you know, a year over year improvement based on any procurement schedules that they have for vehicles. So um, ultimately, of course, the goal of 100 or, or all vehicles, but um, RTD is not going to be able to, to get there overnight. So, so what is the appropriate measure? Um, and and we, did, uh, we did have a little bit of back and forth internally on our team about which way uh, to go there. So, um, so thank you for the question. Yes, I, I, and particularly with, with that metric, um, it, it could be either or. And say, I, I agree. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, definitely when it comes to showing a number as a metric, uh, showing a single data point versus a trend is definitely not favorable. Uh, showing, in addition to showing a trend, showing comparison to the same period last year or same period last quarter, uh, as well as then comparing that to a target. So maybe an overarching direction is we definitely encourage for, for if not all these metrics to always track it over a trend line, track it over a prior period, and then compare it to a target. In the absence of all of that, the second best thing would be is to look at the percent of total and seeing if that percent is changing. So we, we, we definitely recognize what you're, what you're noting. Yes. Just want to check in. Elise, is there anything else based on the, kind of the, the metrics that we've heard that might need additional refinement from your perspective before I turn it over to Chris? Um, well, I guess just that, that um, discussion that was just had by the expert saying, ideally, you'd be able to report the trend. Um, and I would say, it'd say where it might be useful to report the absolute and the percentage, depending on what it is. Um, when we put together recommendations around that, I guess I'd like to see that reflected that in an ideal world, we'd be able to do that um, and make sure, sure we don't lose uh, track of that important nuance. Okay, thanks, Elise. Um, you guys think in, a, in an ideal world, we'd be able to get all electric buses that were sourced uh, their power 100% from renewable energy? Like, I, I, I don't quite know the level we should push to. On your Allah. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'll, I'll take that question, and, and which is to say, um, but that is something I, I think RTD is going to have to take a look at, right, in terms of setting that target and what that goal is and what's reasonable for them to achieve within a certain period of time. And, you know, and in an ideal world, it, you could flip the switch and it would happen, but, but what's realistic? Um, and an RTD, I think, would need to take a look at, you know, what is their, you know, what, um, the, what's their percentage, what's their number of vehicles that are considered low emission now, what do their procurements look like in the future? And then kind of, you know, do that baseline measurement to make a determination of what is a realistic goal. 
the the other thing chris is the is, is the macroeconomics of the electric and the autonomous vehicles and and how much how quick is the world going to overall move towards there so there are things that we agree with you i agree with tanya as well that we we we'd want to understand how much what is the investment going to take how much change in the infrastructure is going to need to is going to need to happen how does this impact the the bottom line as it relates to financials and so forth because it it wouldn't make sense to have contradicting goals where we want to achieve 100% uh, fleet in the next five years where our financial standing would be impacted uh, significantly. So definitely it's a balance between uh, and it would be what, what works best for RTD as well as where the industry is going and the macro, macro technology is going and the economics would make sense. So all respect to the awesome people from RTD on here, but I think we're an accountability a committee. And so in, in my mind, I think, and I do know that people are awesome. I, I just would like to say that I don't feel like that's a strong enough metric. I don't feel like it's a strong enough indicator of success around air quality issues. Um, and so for me, that one is a, is a, is, is just too, too light of a score for, for us to not consider the whole and to say the number we care about is the number of electric vehicles or the number of low emission vehicles, I, I just don't think that's that's a that's enough of a push. Um, you know, I'm uh, there. You go. And that's my that's my two cents. And and I I will share just so you guys know. And I do have some expertise with this. It is unbelievable the change from when we started in downtown Denver to what we can do with um, environmentally friendly buildings and the and the the dramatically lower cost to be able to do it. And it is, it is a place where Moore's law is at play because it is really computer solving the problem. And so the changes are dramatic to the point where it is now cheaper for us to build in certain districts, certain municipalities um, to build green than it is to build the old fashioned way. So, and that, that's happened in five years. And so being ready for it and being prepared for it, we're, we as a company, I do not mean to be patting us on ourselves on the back. It's happening across the real estate industry. I, I don't know why it wouldn't happen in the vehicular industry. And so setting it as a goal, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. And, and it also, every other goal is so nice and, and um, comprehensive. And, and then there's this one sort of very specific tactic. And that may not even be the best way for RTD to actually achieve the goal of way lower em emissions. So I don't know what it is. Don't idle. Like, you know, idling is terrible. So let's make it so they never idle. So I don't know what the right metric is, guys, but I feel like that one could be pushed on. Um, and then, Dea, if you don't mind, could we yeah, flip we back to the ones about customer satisfaction? What we were gonna. Yeah, I think uh, Tanya, your our someone on your team is the one. <laughs> there we go. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, is this the? slide, Chris, that you were looking at or that you were referring to? I think to? this was the only slide, and I apologize. I, for some, I don't think we have this, right? Do we have this? Okay. No, we will get this after this. Is there another slide, guys, on customer experience? Yeah. Um, I think the, the metric you might be looking for um, is the one where we ask about frequency. So, um, Sarah, that would be the... Uh, yeah. So it's interesting. So this is a little bit the same thing, and, and uh, everybody's heard me talk about this since day one, but I really, really, and I, Deborah's at least expressed some interest in it. I, I, I don't know a company that run, runs this big that doesn't have net promoter score somehow um, in its in its metrics. I, I don't know if this ends up in. I, I just think it's a nice metric. Would you recommend the bus to somebody else? Is a great question. And honestly, everything else is us assuming what will make the customer happy. Um, I, I'm not saying they're not good metrics that RTD should use to to judge themselves, but um, you know, increase the ridership is a good one. We obviously want increased ridership, but we may be getting increased ridership for reasons, you know, it's a bad economy or, you know, so I, I, I think people's satisfaction feels good. And I think these are good recommendations around what those uh, things that could get them there are, but I also recognize we'll be gone after July and RTD will be running this for a long time. So, you know, what are the, what are the things that what, what is the one question? And I think at least as it relates to customer, it, 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 by the way, is not a bad internal question. Would you recommend somebody work at RTD as the exact same value? And so um, 
there you go. I don't, I don't, I don't have a perfect answer around that, but I feel like that that's more encompassing and it's driving them towards finding, you know, these are some ideas you might have, but boy, it'd be nice to have a couple of more comprehensive ones that would be organizing for the organization rather than check-ins for outsiders. Understood. Thank you. I have just a couple quick follow-up questions, if that's okay. Um, really appreciate the, the great feedback. Um, I, I want to go back to your, your comment about sort of the green building. So one of the things we wanted to make sure that, that we were measuring were the proposed metrics that, that we would were measuring were something, something that RTD can feasibly do without doing a feasibility study, right? So if we were to look at, you know, CO2 emissions, they'd have to hire someone to do that. Um, and, and, you know, kind of do that calculation, do that study, what's their impact on the region, that sort of thing. But you bring up a really interesting point with the buildings, right? So, you know, are you suggesting perhaps that, you know, a, a look at how energy efficient or how many energy efficient buildings are? Yeah, I mean, the truth, is, the truth is that it's all of RTD's environmental footprint that impacts us all, no, you know, no different. And so, um, if I was to make a Fox News joke, I'd say no more serving cheeseburgers at the commissary, right? Like it, it's it's something and, and you know, it's hard to measure footprint. It's very, very difficult. So I don't tend to have a perfect metric, um, but I but I do know that um, large organizations and companies all over the world are really taking a look at their, their, their full program. We have not, and I think this is important, we as an advisory committee have not discussed this enough to be able to make a specific recommendation around it. It, it, maybe other people on the committee feel comfortable enough that they know. And, you know, Elise obviously in her uh, part of town thinks about it a lot. Um, so I, maybe there's some good expertise out there, but we haven't studied that kind of holistic comprehensive. So I don't know if there's a way for us to sort of say, and oh, by the way. Um, but, I, but I think that's the kind of thing that RTD really can organize itself around as it moves forward and look for all kinds of opportunities. Um, you know, to be silly, I, I got to imagine, Deborah, you're a huge buyer of energy from Excel. So it's a different kind of contract. It's a different kind of negotiation. And so um, I, I don't know exactly, but I, I do think there's a more comprehensive way to look at the, the whole of RTD rather than just we've got low emission vehicles. Um, it certainly feels important. Low emission vehicles seem important. Um, and, you know, but as you guys know, to belabor the point, an electric vehicle in South Carolina is powered by coal because 96% of their, 94% of their um, power sources are non-renewable. I mean, that's, so you're not really doing much good by having an electric vehicle there. You got low emission, but over on the other side, they're pumping out coal. So, you know, it, it really is a, it is a larger and more difficult question. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chris. I... So now that I've had that question, I look forward to figuring out how everybody else solves it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I recognize I'm no help at all. So. <laughs> uh, no, but I do think lifting up a couple of these things, and, and that's why you know we want to go around and just ask folks, because again, some of these do need a, a little bit of tweaking, just to make sure that, again, as we are a committee, are coming up with recommendations, again, these are recommendations, that we're getting to the intent of what we we sought out to do at the beginning, which included considering environmental impact as part of the recommendation. So thank you for, for pushing us along that way. Um, I'm gonna go to Rut and then Kristen, really focusing on additional refinements based on the, the set of um, objective metrics and metrics that you've heard so far. Just to follow up on what Chris said, this issue of coal, the long tailpipe, you know, you, you do have very distinct differences in how you source your energy. The other thing I want to say is on electric vehicles, when you're looking at, at the life of an electric vehicle, to have the FDA basically saying 500K miles is ridiculous because the warranty that uh, Tesla's delivering or going to be delivering on their long haul trucks is a million mile warranty. And that even includes the brakes because it's recursive uh, uh, regenerate, regenerative uh, braking. So all of these statistics, th there has to be a lot of flexibility in how they're implemented over time. For example, there's very low maintenance on electric vehicles. So you might look at the price and say, oh, we can't afford these. But if you look, if you look at the actual uh, cost of ownership over time, it's very much impacted by things like that, 
by depreciation, um, you know, especially being able to monitor the amount of money you're spending on maintenance and the amount of money you're spending on repairs, uh, which is very low. And, and some things like oil changes you'd think is regular maintenance, but there are no oil changes with electric vehicles. So there are all kinds of issues there where, where the, the savings can be hidden by the depreciation. If you say, well, it can't last more than 500,000 miles, or you say, well, um, you know, this, this costs too much to buy. And we'll see that with buses, especially the first rounds. There's a lot of electric buses in China right now. That's it. Chris, you look like you had something you wanted to add. Sorry, I was going to say, and coal trains. And I was, I was also going to add that the problem is the buses cost more. So they, they've geniusly moved the, away from the maintenance and service centers and onto the buyer of the product. But uh, yeah, it ain't easy. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Rhett. Um, Kristen, I'm going to turn to you if there's any, again, based on what you've heard, any additional refinements um, that should be considered as we to move this recommendation further along. I am looking at the, thanks Dea. I, I'm looking at the slide, the equity and accessibility slide. Um, under the serve all customers, the percent of elevator escalator availability, is, that's a really interesting and important um, sort of thing to look at. However, that's really getting into the weeds and I would like to see something a little bit broader as far as the services that RTD provides. And RTD definitely is, is in a better place right now. Um, as far as adherence to the ADA zero denial service request, my question is, is this zero denials as in driving by people at bus stops using wheelchairs or is this something where it's a, a broader zero denial service? I That that question could go either way. I have notes on that. Um, give me just a moment here to make sure I am getting this just right. Um, so this is related to um, the um, mandate that RTD serve within uh, uh, three quarters of a mile of their services uh, for paratransit. So um, ensuring that those service requests are honored. Okay, that, see, that, that's, that's why I had the question, Tanya, because I didn't, I didn't know what you folks were trying to get at. Um, right now, I don't think that that is really an issue as far as it, you know, adhering to the, that three quarter of a mile. In fact, I, I really think RTD is going over and above that, um, especially well after COVID, RTD was pulling bus routes. And the rule is, of course, if there is no fixed bus route within three quarters of a mile of a customer, then paratransit does not have to be offered. Well, RTD has gone really over and above by saying it doesn't matter if that route has been canceled temporarily, we are still going to provide paratransit. So that I think is, is wonderful. Um, but yeah, that's the, the, uh, my, the other thing I brought up was one of the reasons why there are no more people in wheelchairs being passed up at bus stops is because CCDC sued RTD on that subject in 2013. So it goes back to the dark ages of trying to fix things and unfortunately having to get out the bigger bat to fix that. So that's why I asked that question, Tanya, and thank you for answering that. It's, it's difficult to come up with the metrics for the, the objectives of serving all customers. There could be so many different questions that are asked on this. And I'm going back to the original, original conversation the operations committee had as far as improving the customer experience and me saying, well, 
we're not going to have people serving drinks on the 15L and Chris saying, oh, I would be riding up and down Colfax all day long. <laughs> See, I remember things, Chris, I'm sorry. There's a- It's really unfortunate because I'd like you to forget that one. <laughs> but it was so good. Uh, there are so many different things that you can look at as far as increasing customer experience. And I believe that is really that really gets to the core of increasing ridership as far as increasing customer experience. I believe that is one of the big reasons why, besides COVID, that ridership of RTD was declining. And not to rhyme, but I'll stop opining. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. Um, so I am gonna take a little bit of facilitator privilege and just share my own feedback and then also lift up a comment that Rhett has um, in the chat around zero scape uh, transit vehicle access for wheelchairs. Um, in terms of the, the metrics themselves, you know, I, I really would like to see us move beyond Title VI um, when it comes to equity. Um, I feel like Title VI is the baseline. And, and I know RTD is, is doing a lot of work when it comes to equity and how it shows up in terms of fares. But again, just an acknowledgement that Title VI just sets, sets kind of the, what, I, what I and what I've heard from transit advocates as the, the minimum standard um, to achieve equity. Um, but I agree. I, I see it on here. That's great. That's fine. I, I guess when I say equity, for me, I'm also looking at it in terms of, um, you know, how are we supporting community wealth building and community wealth building standards in this committee and in, in the RT Accountability Committee? We've talked a lot about TMOs and really working with Lyft and Uber. However, we're missing community owned cooperatives um, like taxi services that contribute to the local economy and build local wealth. And so, I know our RTD has a number of, um, you know, W um, women and minority-owned businesses and, and contracts and things like that that they kind of track and how they're how they're supporting those businesses. But I'd also like to see some sort of reflection on how we're supporting community wealth building efforts, really seeing RTD as an anchor institution. So that's number one. The other thing that I'm thinking about, and I, Chris kind of mentioned this, um, one thing that's missing in these metrics is certainly around workforce and the RTD workforce and really employee retention and employee, appreci employee appreciation. <laughs> um, I don't know how that shows up in other, um, in other agencies, but that's something that I think is front of mind for me. When I think about operations, that was a, a charge of this committee to look at workforce and workforce retention that I would like to see, I think in a future in the next iteration of this as we continue to refine and get to a, a recommendation. Um, and then just to echo I, what Elise and what Chris have said, um, I really wish we could add a couple more metrics or another metric, maybe a little bit um, stronger when it comes to environmental impact. Um, there's, a, I think, a lot of things that are, are missing and, and opportunities because, again, we are in a state that's not going to meet our air quality um, our air quality goals. And, and that's a, a real concern. And there's a lot of conversation happening at the state level. So those are just a couple of things that stood out to me as I was looking and, and as you all were going through this. One other thing, sorry, that came to mind. <laughs> um, civic engagement and partnerships. That's great. I, I, I also wonder like that, that seems like a really soft metric, like the number of presentations you do at in community. Um, that's a good metric, but at the end of the day, how are we partnering with community organizations in really deep intentional ways? I think one example of that is the LIVE program, which Mile High Connects has been partnering with RTD to get the word out on this program. So how do we just track those kinds of partnerships in a much more um, strategic and intentional way? So with that, I know we are about five minutes over time, six minutes over time. And so I wanna, I do wanna move us on. Tanya, it seemed like you had a next steps slide. So I will give you just a couple of minutes to kind of walk through the next steps if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I'll just, and, and actually, Sarah, it's okay. You can uh, stop the screen share, that's okay. We can, I can cover it verbally. 
um, you know, we're just going to go back do some refinements based on on what we've heard today, and then we'll be sending over, um, you know, that report that will have the the details of the recommendations in there for you all, so you can see what some of these things are um, in, in a little bit more detail. Great. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for taking this on and pushing us forward when it comes to a recommendation. Um, in the last 10 minutes or so, I um, want to shift the conversation to our to the partnership recommendation. Just as a reminder for this committee, um, as part of a joint governance and operations committee that we had back in early March, we were really focused on the conversation or the topic of partnerships and how that showed up um, within RTD. Again, this is all in, in, in the vein of um, facilitating and enabling partnerships be between RTD and other transit agencies and other nonprofits in order to, to really better um, serve the community and serve those that rely on transportation. The governance subcommittee, I think a lot of you all are members of that committee. Um, they received the recommendation on uh, Monday. And so we wanted to have just a brief conversation with this committee about what might be some potential um, either refinements or opportunities to bring some of the operations perspective into the recommendation that the governance committee is considering. So um, what I'm going to do is share my screen, although you all should have this in your packet, um, but I'm just gonna share my screen briefly for those of you that haven't had a chance to review it. This is the redlined version. Um, the bullet points themselves, for those that might be joining us on the phone, um, the first bullet point is leverage existing and new partnerships to improve service um, and grow ridership. This really focus on, focuses on local governments, anchor institutions, TMOs, so transportation management um, organizations and employers and employer centers. The second is around incentivizing communities to enter into cost sharing agreements. Um, the third bullet is explore opportunities to provide cost-effective local transportation through services by collaborating with existing mobility service providers via Uber Lyft. Um, the next one is as more federal relief funds become available, expand partnerships to improve service efficiency, consider a competitive um, innovation grant. Uh, the second from the bottom um, bullet point is focused on the public facing dashboard, which includes um, existing partnerships. You may want to revisit that as part of our conversation right now. Um, and then the last one is evaluate uh, the success of existing partnerships by predetermined metrics and rescope relationships. So again, these are the recommendations um, that are, are, are being considered or at least putting for, being put forth by the um, governance committee. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I am going to ask for this committee's insights. Uh, if there are things that we need to refine kind of based on our conversation right now around our dashboard and metrics that we may want to bring at least for consideration um, to the governance committee, let's have that conversation now. So I am not afraid to call on people again. So. <laughs> I'm going to start with Kristen. Kristen, do you have any insights on um, the recommendation around partnerships? Is there anything that's missing in terms of uh, operations that we may want to add to this recommendation? And I'm not sure where you're going. Can you be a little bit more specific? Yeah, so there's a couple of things that are in there around um, providing cost-effective local transportation um, fixed routes in areas where fixed routes might not necessarily be the most appropriate solution. So as we think about service, is there anything that might be missing um, from your kind of vantage point that we as an operations committee might want to refine a little bit? Well, I know right now RTD is beginning to partner in, I think, four different zip codes with Uber and Lyft. However, those vehicles are not um, wheelchair accessible necessarily as far as possibly community um, uh, help partnering with different community providers I'm thinking of things like Lakewood rides um, operations well it used to be the um, the senior resource center and now that's being run by via so that was actually a very successful community partnership. 
I, I think that that is something that we really should look into as far as those types of partnerships. Uber and Lyft is a really good start, but let's branch out on that a little bit more and be more specific as far as what communities are going to be served. So I'm hearing there may be some refinement in terms of accessibility and how that shows up within these um, these partnerships. Yes. I think right now it focuses on. Well, and it, that just to take the weight off of RTD providing transportation options, accessibility always needs to be in the paragraph. Great. All right, I'm gonna check in with Elise and then with Chris. Are there any items that need refinement from an operations standpoint? Um, Ed, I appreciate you asking the question and I'm looking because I feel like I've looked at these and provided feedback in a lot of different forums and I probably didn't segment, well, this is governance, this is operations, this is finance. So I'm trying to think if there's any other refinement that since we just discussed these in, on Monday and I. Uh, I don't have anything else to say that I haven't already said. So I think a lot of this is about operations um, for sure, but I, I, I feel like it's it's pretty solid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like it's been about five minutes since I've said net, net promoter score. So I'm happy to get on and say it again if you like, but <laughs> I, I don't have anything. Uh, and and Rod would like to talk about how um, the, the warranties last on electric buses. So those are our two. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good recommendation. I mean, it is, I'm, I'm a member of the governance subcommittee. I think it is a good solid recommendation. A lot of this is, operat is operational, but just lifting up that as a committee, we haven't had the opportunity to discuss it. So wanting to give us an opportunity to jump in if there's- if And there's we're gonna all get together again, right? As we kind of bundle all this up, so. Exactly, yeah. Um, so what we could decide as a committee, again, it's going to move forward. So we as the operations committee could say, we agree this aligns with everything that we have talked about. In fact, that's kind of the read that I'm getting from this group, maybe with just a little bit of a tweak, but not too much around the um, accessibility pieces, Kristen, that you lifted up. It is within one of the bullet points that says also explore opportunities to contract with other third party uh, providers that specialize in a particular service like air transit, but I wonder if maybe that, again, just to lift that up as a, a priority of this committee might be worth a little bit of a tweak, um, if that sounds good for everyone. So generally though, I'm, I'm getting the read from members of this committee that yes, we, we are in full alignment with what the governance committee is putting forward. So, great. All right, wanted to give you all at least 10 minutes of conversation if there was any conversation on this. Um, so in terms of our agenda, um, I just wanna check in with members of the committee to see if there's any uh, member comments or any other matters that we wanna bring up at this moment before we close out today's meeting. Brett, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, the one thing that I, I didn't see in here that I know we've talked about, I don't know if it was governance or where it was, but adding something about the goal of the partnership is to be real specific. And the other one is what are the roles and responsibilities of the partners in the partnership? That's a good point, Rhett. That may have been in the governance committee, but let's, let's bring this as part of the operations committees. Like you wanna lift this up. The other thing that I was just thinking about now that you mentioned that is around the dashboard itself. We may yeah. wanna just include maybe a metric or two that we, um, so that North Highlands may have presented and share that as a potential connection between the two committees. Yeah, I would think that this could be integrated into the dashboard, the partner stuff, it should be mm -hmm. part of it. Because a lot of people go looking for partner partnering opportunities and to have a place, you know, where the, rules and responsibilities of those partnerships are clearly laid out, and what RTD is looking for and what other organizations may be looking for, where the fit exists. So just to kind of wrap this up in terms of this 
the partnership recommendation and the connection to our transparency dashboard to our the dashboard recommendation um, for the North Highlands team that, that are still on the call. As I'm digging back in my memory from 20 minutes ago, I don't remember seeing anything around partnerships. So we do need to have that reflected within our recommendation. Um, so thank you for lifting that up, Brett. That was an oversight. Um, all right. Anything else from this committee? Okay. Thank you so much for the conversation. Thank you so much for letting me pick on each of you to offer your feedback and insight. Um, it is 3.57 and we're gonna go ahead and close out today's meeting. You all get an extra 30 minutes back of your day. Thanks, Daya. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Daya. Have a good afternoon.